Vingegaard est vieux. Non, vieux. You have been told many lies. It speaks not only of a place, but a plan. What all but require the creation of a new world? But that is something only the gods can do, and I am no god. He was here. Sauron was here. What do you know of darkness? Hello, family. I just made it easier for you to learn about Stranger Thinking Media and our uh, product line, products and services. I added to our YouTube channel uh, some links. Uh, this link will get you to the website. This link will get you to Instagram. This one to Facebook. And this one to our Amazon authors page. And from there, you can actually order our products. So it's that simple now. And if you want, you just click on one of the products and it takes you right to the ordering page. So if you want to do some stranger thinking, come on over, hit the links. And remember always to like, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next video. Hello once again, family. We're here to continue our study on the uh, Book of Jubilees uh, in this video entitled If Satan Cast Out Satan. Um, this basically is, uh, we're going to go a little bit more in detail on what the kingdom of Satan is. And uh, I know we've all grown up with that, uh, you know, that concept of the devil and all that stuff, but do we really understand what it is or he is or what his purpose is? And, you know, just in just growing up around the church and in the church, you, you get the feeling that people, you know, they just don't have a strong foundation in what they're up against. So now uh, we're going to continue. Uh, again, we're studying in the book of Jubilees, but of course we're going to, uh, break out scriptures from the actual canonized Bible. And then we're going to rehash some stuff for those who haven't seen the uh, previous videos. Um, so, because sometimes I take it for granted that you've, you know, watched all the videos. Um, and if you haven't, you should, 
you see there's a lot of information in the previous videos um so with that said uh let's continue so we're looking here in uh, the book of matthew chapter 10 verse 1 and uh you know I, I know a lot of people that you know they go to church and they might even read the bible um you know and they might even teach but it's like we're too grounded in the secular world i mean do you really understand that we fight not against flesh and blood there is a more real world this world is but a shadow of something that is much more real so if you can't if, if that doesn't sink in, then you are not worshiping God in spirit. You have to get into the spirit of the matter and understand the warfare is in the spirit. Because if you can, can I think it's in Proverbs, a man who can't rule his spirit is like a city without walls. You can be, you can be attacked and constantly overrun. But a man who can rule his spirit is like, it's like, you know, the walls of Jerusalem. You, 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 they may besiege you, but you can hold your ground, you know. So we want to get deeper into the spirit of the matter because that's the real matter, you know. So here in Matthew 10, chapter 1, it says, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, if you look around today, you don't see, I mean, it, yeah, it's still there, but you don't see it a lot. You don't see people casting out demons. You, you know, if you have issues, most people will run to a therapist or a psychiatrist. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to damn them. You know, they've been actually trained, but their training is more observational. It's still not getting to the root of the matter. And the mat, root of the matter is a spiritual matter. So you can, by observation, see the outcome and say, hey, you need to stop doing this or you need to practice doing that. But at the end of the day, by doing some of those things, you know, you are actually accidentally invoking principles to cast out demons or unclean spirits. So... You know, but I'm I'm going to focus on the spiritual matter because to worship the the great Elohim, you have to worship in spirit. So let's get down to the spirit of the matter. These disciples were given power against unclean spirits. So that being said, um, let's take a look at some more uh, situations where uh, Yahusha. The one you call Jesus, of course. Um, I'll go. Sometimes you'll hear me go back and forth between the terms, but his Hebrew name is Yahusha. That's his actual name. So I tend to, in real life, use that name more. So just remember, if I say Jesus or if I say Yahusha, I'm, I'm really talking about the Messiah, the same guy. Uh, so then, in Matthew twelve and twenty-two. Through 24, it says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Okay, those Pharisees. I think another term for Pharisees, and at some point we'll dig into that. Uh, another word for Pharisee is Pharisee. And if you are a student of history, what you'll find out is that uh, was uh, Constantine, the emperor. His father, I believe, was a Pharisee. Let that sink in for a minute. Um, but we have time to dig into stuff like that a little later. But... Anyway, let's look at, look at another example of uh, Yahusha, Jesus, dealing with the spiritual entities. And, Je and Jesus knew their thoughts, meaning the Pharisees, and said unto them, 
every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall, shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of Yahuwah Elohim, the Lord God, then the kingdom of Elohim is come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. So when you pray, do you pray that for for the Most High to bind the spiritual entities affecting your life? If, if you're in a situation when you're praying, do you say, oh, God, help me, da, da, da. Or do you go into detail? Because there's certain things promised to you. That, what you bind here on earth is bound in heaven. So when you pray, you bind that thing. You, you speak it. You say, Father, bind that spirit. Bind that. I, I say it like bind that Nephilim. You know, bind that demon, right? And then set the captive free. Set me free, right? So your prayer is your tool for war. All right? So he mentions Satan's kingdom. And so, I mean, we take that for granted. It's an actual kingdom. And it is made up of a certain order of things. And we're going we're gonna to get a little more into that, so pay attention. So, first got to understand Satan means adversary. I think most people, especially been in and around the church, you kind of know that. But is an adversary necessarily one person? I mean, if you watch... Uh, uh, a football game um, or a basketball game. Say the adversary of the Knicks is the Lakers. You know, it's a it's a team. And so a team can be your adversary, right? So even though you don't say adversaries necessarily, doesn't necessarily mean it, you know uh, adversary is kind of a uniplural term. So Satan itself is a kingdom, a kingdom of adversaries. And that might shock some of you. You think of when you think of Satan, you think of this one guy, but it's an actual kingdom, and it has, a, like I said, a pecking order. And uh, um, we should we'll probably talk about it a little more. What I before I actually get into that part, I want to get maybe towards the end of the of this video to start talking about that a little more in depth. So let's just continue with the with the slides. Ah, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through the dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first state. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. So, you know, like in, in, in all things, if you understand, if you've paid attention to the previous videos, you understand that the unclean spirits are simply the disembodied uh, Nephilim, and a Nephilim are the hybrid children of angels and men. You know, the Watchers came down and procreated with uh, human women and produced this hybrid called Nephilim. Generally, uh, denoted as giants, but not necessarily all giants, just uh, kind of a superhuman species, you know, uh, very evil, um, completely outside the will of God. And so when they were killed in the flood, of course, their spirits, you know, could not go back to the Most High Yah, you know, because he did not create them. They were an abomination to him. So their spirits had nowhere to go. So they were forced to roam the earth. Um, but you also got to understand that's also a physical gene. 
because there was a physical uh, impreg impregnation of uh, women, generally considered the the wives of of the line of Cain, because um, they still existed, right? Uh, but we, if if King David is fighting Goliath the giant. Uh, descendant of the Nephilim, that means that gene continued. How did that gene continue? Well, Noah was a man who was perfect in his gene narrations, his genes. He was not tainted with Nephilim gene. And you would assume his wife uh, was the one carrying the Nephilim gene, but not necessarily. You know, I, I didn't want people to, you know, I mentioned that in a previous video, but I, I don't want people. Uh, pointing the finger at her necessarily because Noah's sons also had wives. Any one of them could have uh, carried that gene. But if you really look at it, um, for instance, uh, the Philistines are descended from the Kaftarites, as I'm, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but I believe that was a Hamitic people. Um, but the, and the Horites were Canaanitic, Canaanitic, Canaanite people. Um, so that gene, and I start to wonder, and I don't have any proof of this, but when the Most High cursed Canaan, and let's not get it twisted, he did not curse Ham, he cursed his son Canaan. Now, Canaan, we'll get into that too, but Canaan, he fulfilled the curse. He, he brought the curse on himself, but also, could it be that Ham's wife may have had that uh, gene in her? And then it got passed to Canaan, and so maybe Noah saw something um, in that. I, I don't know. I'm just speculating on that part. But we do know that... Uh, there were giants in the land at the time the children of Israel entered into the promised land. You know, our king of Bashan. We know the story of David and Goliath. Goliath was also of the Anakim, Rephaim. You know, he had that Nephilim bloodline, which is why he was a giant. But don't get stuck on that. Nephilim doesn't necessarily have to be a giant. And I say that for a reason. So, anyway... Understand that these Nephilim, when they were disembodied, when they were killed during the flood, and their spirits had to leave their fleshly tabernacles, their bodies, they had nowhere to go. They wandered the earth. But it's like if you're used to living in a house, now you find yourself out in a desert somewhere, and it's hot, and the sun is beating down, and you, you yearn for you know, shelter. If it's cold, you yearn for shelter. If it's windy, you want shelter. These disembodied spirits want shelter. They want to be in a body. Hence, the issues we have today. They are kind of jealous of, of humans that have bodies. And if they have the chance, they will inhabit your body. They will take you over if you open that door. So... Anyway, and, and this scripture is kind of talking about that situation. So, you know, a man who cannot rule his spirit is like a city without walls. But if you don't have walls and a gate and you don't keep it closed, anything will walk up in there. So keep that in mind. You know, you have to have rule of your spirit, lest something enter in and spring up and take root. Like Paul said, let a root of bitterness, for instance, take root. You know, anything could take root in your little city. So these things are waiting to enter in and take control of you. Because they'll feel at home. And not only that, since there's, I guess, <laughs> the, uh, houses are in demand, meaning human bodies are in demand, sometimes they have to bring their buddies with them give them shelter too so you keep your if your front door is open your back door might be open and they'll come in that way so keep your front door closed keep your back door closed keep your window shut and locked and these things can't enter in and how do you keep that locked like i said you rule your spirit but how do you rule your spirit 
you know, for the believer, it's through the spirit of the most high, you know, lean on that. And so sometimes you go along in life and you got yourself in order and things are going great. And then maybe you get a little cocky and, and arrogant and maybe things start going so good that you start losing sight of the most high. Well, your walls are coming down. Once you lose lose sight of the Most High, remember, the devil tempted Jesus and said, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world if you will just bow down and worship me. And I don't think we understand how heavy a burden that was. It sounds easy. He told, he told Satan, go get hence, get away from me, go. The devil just offered him legit all the kingdoms of the earth. How many of you could have passed that up? I mean, half of you couldn't pass, half of you wouldn't pass up $100 if it was offered to you. I'm just saying, the entire world was offered to Jesus, and he didn't even blink. He said, get out of here, because he already knows it belongs to him rightfully anyway, and he's going to get it. He just has to go through the process. So, that being said, uh, if, you, if you lose sight, you start falling away. Now the devil can come in. And if the house is really organized and clean and swept and it's a really nice house, he's not going to want to leave. He's going to dig in. And so, you know, we, we as believers, we have our moments where we're, we're all in. The walls are up. The doors are shut. We're sweeping clean up our house. And then there's those moments where we open the door and let anything in. And then, of course, when they see the house is swept, they go, wow, the doors are open. This is great. Let me bring my buddies in. And the last state is worse than the first state. So every time you clean up, you actually make yourself more attractive to those entities. And so, you know, it's 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 kind of scary. The the better you become, the brighter your light shines, the more attention you start receiving from these uh, spiritual forces. So we see it all the time in what we call the preacher's kids syndrome. So if you're out there preaching and, and people are listening, you know the devil's got to put a stop to that. And, and you become a target at that point. It's all manner of unclean, foul pigeons start hovering around you but you have the ultimate weapon that's your faith and use your prayer because prayer is, is is the club you know we put on the full armor the helmet of salvation the breastplate of uh, righteousness gird about with truth uh, with the shield of faith turn back the darts of the enemy and the sword of the spirit of the word in your mouth to cut them to cut them to pieces you know, um, and then there's one other thing that they, Paul doesn't mention, but it, it was mentioned, I believe. I, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it might have been in the book of Isaiah, um, where one of the garments of the armor is, the, I think, the cloak of uh, re retribution, you know. So, something like that. I, I have to look at it again, but um, it, it seems like Paul just left that one out. He probably wasn't the right time to mention that one but but he left that one out so anyway let's continue we got a lot a uh, long way to go so in mark chapter 5 verse 1 through 7 and they came over onto the other side of the sea into the country of the gadarenes and when he was come out of the ship immediately they met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit there goes that unclean spirit again who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him. So this was a particularly powerful uh, unclean spirit, demonic force. And it probably was one of the ruling Nephilim once upon a time. You know, he just can't get over it. <laughs> uh, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him, and always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. 
But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. He knows his end is in torments. And, uh, you know, some of them said, Have you come to torment me before the time? They know their judgment is coming. Mark chapter 5, verse 8 through 13. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Notice, Jesus commands them. They, they have to answer him. They understand his, his lineage and his power. And he, besought him, and he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there were there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea. They were about two thousand and were choked in the sea. Now, if you think about that, think about what just happened here. And I'm going to speculate a little bit more, just in the spirit. Again, these entities know they're about to be cast out of a human body. They do not want to leave their domain, their domicile. They're in a nice house. Uh, okay, it's a, it's not a nice house. It's a broke down house. But, and of course, they broke it down. It was probably a nice house once upon a time, and they broke it down, having that man do all sorts of crazy things. But but it was better than being back out on the, I guess you would say, on the streets. So they besought, besought him that he would not send them away out of the country. Uh, country? Well, are they talking about uh, Judea or are they talking about the man? Is the man the country? I don't know. You know. But they don't want to get kicked out of their house, basically, is what it is. So they said, hey, I tell you what, there's a bunch of pigs over there. Can you send us into those pigs? Now, why would you do that if the pigs are just going to run down the hill and drown themselves, and then the Nephilim are going to be out in the cold again anyway. Well, I think what it was is, again, a human human being has a certain level of resistance. Animals don't. If a demon gets in an animal, no telling what's going to happen to the animal. There will be no self-control whatsoever. So I guess they thought being in a pig would be better than being out in the cold, but when they get into these pigs, the pigs just short circuit and jump off the cliff. You know, at least human beings have a certain amount of control. These animals don't. So when they enter into the pigs, the pigs just short circuit and jump off the cliff and die, and then these demons end up being homeless anyway. At least that's my take on it. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you see it differently. Uh, so the next one is, okay, so here we're in 1 Samuel, and I kind of want to make a point here, because, you know, they were dealing with the demonic forces, even back in King David's time, right? Um, so let's, let's dig in here a little bit. I want you to see, you know, Jesus focuses a lot on um, removing evil spirits. But in a sense, it's a prophetic uh, concurrence to his claim to the throne of David. Because there's certain things David, certain gifts David had. And Yahushua, Jesus, had to, by showing these same gifts, he is pointing to his similar abilities as his predecessor, King David. So I, I know in the Christian church, a lot of times we lose sight of the Hebrew nature of the Messiah. But let's make no mistake. He was of the tribe of Yehuda, Judah. <laughs> it was actually Yehuda. Uh, most people say Judah or Jews. And he was literally a descendant of King David, specifically on his mother's side. And, you know, I know a lot of people have hangups about that and they say no that that uh, uh joseph he, he had to be uh jesus 
actual father were misinterpreted. No, we're not misinterpreting that because if you remember back in Genesis, it said the woman's seed shall have, there'll be war between the woman's seed and the serpent's seed. And then say the man's seed and the serpent's seed because ultimately the woman's seed is Yahusha, Jesus. And so the bloodline of King David is through the woman, the woman's seed. That mitochondrial seed, which goes back to King David, and a lot of people have an issue with that. But you got to read that. They it specifically says the woman seed. That was a foreshadowing of Mary and her seed, the Messiah, because she is of the line of David. Now Joseph, the stepdad, is also of the of the line of David. I mean, by descendancy. So all the bases are kind of covered on that one. So in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14 through 17, we're here uh, looking at King Saul. He's, 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 he messed up. He's, uh, his, his walls are crumbling, and the enemy is actually literally <laughs> entering in. You know, uh, his physical enemies are getting the best of him and the spiritual. But it started with the spiritual enemies getting the best of him. Um, so it reads, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubles thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is, cunning, who is a cunning player on a harp. And it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. So we see here that the evil spirit is from God. That's, that's, that's a wild thought, isn't it? That just means that everything that's going on, the Most High is in control of. He could squash the adversaries like bugs if he wanted to, but they serve a purpose. You know, in a sense, it, they're like... The, the mean school teacher that keeps you in line. As long as you do right, they have no, you know, they can't yell at you. Um, but also, uh, you will see that uh, King David has a gift. So let's move on here, and we'll see. In First Samuel chapter 16, verse 22, 23, And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that Daoid took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. So King David, or he wasn't the king yet, technically, but he was the king because it was a force... He was already anointed. He was already king. It's just that the rest of the nation hadn't caught on to that fact yet. Um, Saul was wrestling with it, though. <laughs> he could sense it was over. And uh, But David had the ability to drive out evil spirits. And so the son of David, oh, thou son of David, also had that gift of being able to drive out evil spirits, which... In the eyes of the Hebrews, can, I mean, you know, Gentiles read that and they don't get it. In the eyes of the Hebrews, that connected him more to David. Everybody understood David's ability to cast out evil spirits. Here's Yahusha, Jesus Christ, coming and doing the same thing, confirming his lineage. So, uh, we're going to step back into Jubilees, but before we do that, there's a a video I would like to play just for those who, like I say, hadn't uh, been here and seen the previous videos. I want to kind of help bring them up to speed. So uh, everybody, we're going to take a break here and we're going to watch this video. Here's another passage from the book of Enoch. This one, the decree of God delineating the fate of the watchers who copulated with mortal women, sired monsters, and brought sin into the world. Ye have wrought great destruction on the earth, 
and ye shall have no peace nor forgiveness of sin. And inasmuch as they, the watchers, delight themselves in their children, the murder of their beloved ones shall they see, and over the destruction of their children shall they lament, and shall make supplication unto eternity. But mercy and peace shall ye not attain. Upon hearing the fate that awaited them, the watchers are stricken by fear. A death warrant must have seemed a trivial slap on the wrist compared to being on the receiving end of God's proclamation. They beg for forgiveness, but then the implacability of God's words sets in. No supplication for them or their children will affect God's resolve, and they are to be shackled to the earth and banned from heaven for all eternity. Some have hypothesized that demons, as potentially alluded to in the Book of Enoch, are in fact the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. Here's the passage that inspired this line of thought, however fringe. And now the giants, who are produced from the spirits and flesh, shall be called evil spirits upon the earth, and on the earth shall be their dwelling. Evil spirits have proceeded from their bodies, because they are born from men, and from the holy watchers is their beginning and primal origin. They shall be evil spirits on earth, and evil spirits shall they be called. And the spirits of the giants afflict, oppress, destroy, attack, do battle, and work destruction on the earth, and cause trouble. Okay, family, we're, we're back at it again. Hopefully that uh, video was informative. Um, and, you know, that's basically mainly for the people who hadn't seen the previous videos. But I recommend that you start from the beginning and, and watch each video up uh, until back to this one. So you have a good handle on, you know, what I'm talking about. Because if you came in, in in the middle, you might be a little... Might be a little wobbly, might be a little lost. Um, but uh, in the book of Jubilees in chapter 10, uh, verses 1 to 3, uh, we've been over this, but I'll, I'll go through it one more time just so we have a, a clean understanding of what was going on just after the flood um, with Noah and his uh, sons and, and all those who survived the flood. So in Jubilees 10, uh, chapter 10, verse 1 to 3, it says, And in the third week of this jubilee, the unclean demons began to lead astray the children of the sons of Noah and to make to err and destroy them. And the sons of Noah came to Noah, their father, and they told him concerning the demons which were leading astray and blinding and slaying his sons' sons. And he prayed before the Lord his God and said, God of the spirits of all flesh, who has shown mercy unto, unto me and has saved me and my sons from the waters of the flood and has not caused me to perish as thou didst the sons of perdition. For thy grace has been great towards me and great has been thy mercy to my soul. Let thy grace be lift up upon my sons and let not wicked spirits rule over them lest they should destroy them from the earth. But do thou bless me and my sons, that we may increase and multiply and replenish the earth. And thou knowest how thy watchers, those are the fallen, 200 fallen angels, the fathers of these spirits, these unclean spirits, how they acted in my day. And as for these spirits which are living, imprison them and hold them fast in the place of condemnation and let them not bring destruction on the sons of thy servant, my God. For these are malignant and created in order to destroy. And in Jubilees chapter 10, verse 8 through 10, and here's where we're going to kind of get into the setup for the kingdom of Satan. And the Lord our God bade us to bind all. Now this is an angel who was tasked with binding these spirits. And the chief of the spirits, Mastema, came and said, Lord, creator. So Mastema, the chief of the evil spirits, which we would probably call Satan at this point. Um, Lord, creator, let some of them remain before me and let them hearken to my voice and do all that I shall say unto them. 
For if some of them are not left to me, I shall not be able to execute the power of my will on the sons of men. You see, Mastema even understands his purpose in this. He also understands his judgment is coming. For these are for corruption and leading astray before my judgment. For great is the wickedness of the sons of men. And he said, let the tenth part of them remain before me, and let nine parts descend into the place of condemnation, which is Tartaros or Sheol or, or you know, Hades, whatever you want to call it. Um, now, I'm not going to get into it right now, but I know the traditional, oh my God, the traditional sense is that, oh, you die, you go, if you've been bad, you go to hell. Well, that's another video coming because right now, if you understand what this is saying, is that there is a holding place for these spiritual entities. It's not for men. It's, for, it's, it's a prison for these unclean demons and their fathers, the watchers. And somehow it all got thrown together and somehow you get these stories of men burning in hell and da, 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 da. look we're going to get into that and you have you have to get a, a solid foundation if you if you're believing things that are just not in the scriptures you, you know the the hebrews at that time had a solid understanding of what was going on and what what Hades or Sheol was, and it wasn't some everlasting place for humans to be tossed into. You know, I mean, it, it's a long story, but this place of condemnation is a holding cell. Now, the lake of fire is something different. So we'll get into that at some other point. But the lake of fire is a fire that's eternal, that never goes out, and that. It has the ability to destroy both body and spirit, body and soul, whatever you want to call it. And so even angels are not impervious to this Gehenna fire and that they shall be burnt up just as the human beings will be burnt up with their spirits. So that is a different connotation and we'll get into that some other time because this is not time or place for it but i just wanted to throw that in there just to let you know that there's uh, a video coming for that so i i guess i also want to say you know uh, let me go back to that for a minute Mustema is, uh, he's pleading for his children, for the children of the Watchers. It's a family thing, right? And so Mustema, for some reason, this is where it gets weird. Mustema, that's why people say Mustema must be a demon and not an angel, right? Because aren't all the rebellious angels, the Watchers, aren't they all? In Tartarus and in, in, in Hades now, or they're they're all locked and in prison. Is that right? Well, let's think about this. That happens to the Watchers at the time of the flood, right? Um, they're they're judged, their children are destroyed. Well, actually, um, that happened earlier. I, I, let me backtrack. The Nephilim are destroyed by the flood. Their fathers were imprisoned long before that because um, they came to earth and procreated with the human w women, which was an abomination. And so they were judged and tossed into this place of condemnation, Hades or Sheol or, 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 or Tartaros, whatever you want to call it. And then here, uh, about nine-tenths of them or 90% of them are, of the Nephilim are thrown in with them leaving only 10% to trouble human beings because they were too powerful for human men, even in the spiritual form, for human men to uh, do battle with them. They, they just couldn't handle it. I mean, today, we're only facing 10% of the least dangerous ones, 
And they have us on the brink of World War III, if you see what I'm saying. They have us on the brink of destroying the environment. You know, they have us, uh, you know, I can say some, some more stuff, but, you know, uh, I'll be a little politically correct here for right now. <laughs> but they got us just confused as all get out, you know. But, and that's only 10% of the, the lightweights, right? It's a family thing. So this Mistema, he's got the ability to go before the Most High. He's a free radical. He's a free angel. Yet he's evil. He's wicked. And he is uh, he's the defense attorney for the watchers in the, in the Nephilim, I guess. So who is this guy who's able to run around and he's not in this place of condemnation with the others. Well, when, when you get into the book of uh, uh, Enoch, it talks about, uh, this is why I say Satan is a kingdom. It's not, it's uniplural. It's not singular. Because it said that the angel that deceived Chua, and if you know your Hebrew, you know Chua is Eve, uh, the angel that deceived Chua in the Garden of Eden, his name was Gadriel. Gadriel. Let that sink in. He was called Gadriel. I'm not going to say anymore. Just listen to how that sounds. And Gadriel deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden. And if you remember, that serpent was cursed in the Garden of Eden, right? So he received his condemnation at that moment. But it seems he was left to roam the earth. And, and he, he did not uh, share in the condemnation with the others. So it was like, it was as if this one free radical was left above ground <laughs> and uh, the 10% of the Nephilim with him. While the others are in the... Uh, place of condemnation, condemnation. So, Gadriel was condemned in the Garden of Eden, and he got his punishment. And his punishment was, you know, in the physical, it says that the serpent would crawl on his belly, but he was bound to the earth, is what it means. So, this one particular angel was bound to the earth, while the others were put in the place of condemnation. And so, he's able to come before as it says, in the, you know, when they talk about the sons of God going before the, uh, the assembly. So Mestema was still able to have, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations with the Most High or, or at least uh, uh, speak before the assembly, um, the divine council, and, and state his case, which was usually accusations towards the children of men. So... This guy is probably Gadriel. Some people say he's Azazel, but Azazel was one, one, like he 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 was put in solitary confinement. He got a big, sharp, jagged rock, spiritual spiritual rock, I'm sure, dropped on top of him. So he, he was like buried in the lowest of the low. He was like the one that that Yah was you know was most angry with because he's the one that taught men the art of war and and the different ways to kill and uh so he got the worst condemnation i think the most i looked at him as being the most dangerous of the angels but god to the hell is a different angel so as we can see and we're going to really dig deep when we get into the book of Enoch, but I'll keep it kind of simple here. So you got the 200 watchers uh, minus Gadriel, essentially. To, they get buried in Tartaros, but the Gadriel, when he deceived Eve, his condemnation was immediate, and he was bound to the earth there, so he got a different sort of a condemnation, but he's left with his Nephilim. So you start to see the kingdom of the Ashatan, Satan's, 
take place. And remember, if you go to the book of Enoch, it doesn't say Satan. I mean, it does in some parts, but it, it, it also says, and the Satans, plural. But like I said, Satan just means adversary. adversary. Or Satans would be adversaries. But either one could be used to denote kind of a, a kingdom. You can do it either way. Because a kingdom is, in a sense, a uniplural noun. Just as a team. Like, Lakers would be a uniplural noun. It's a team made up of many members. But it was it's talked about as if it's one. So, anyway... Um, that's some interesting stuff. I thought it was interesting as I started digging into it. I thought you might uh, be interested in some of that and it might strengthen your foundation of what you're dealing with. Uh, so let's move on. Um, so now we get to the book of Jasher. I went over this pre in the previous video. And, and God said, and this is at the Tower of Babel. Okay. And God said to the 70 angels who stood foremost before him, to those who were near to him, saying, Come, let us descend and confuse their tongues, that one man shall not understand the language of his neighbor. And they did so unto them. And of course, as I mentioned before, I, when I hear the number 70, it always reminds me of the 70 nation. And then the 70 disciples. And, you know, there's... That number 70 is interesting to me. But the fact that he chooses here 70 angels to go down to confound the nations, and there are 70 nations, right? I find that very in interesting. There's no such thing as coincidence when you talk about Scripture. Everything has a purpose. And if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8, when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, Everybody got their little lot. When he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the ESV Bibles translates it as sons of God, not Israel. Israel didn't exist at that time, of course. And so the Dead Sea Scrolls are the oldest known versions, and it says sons of God. And, of course, we know sons of God usually, well, in the Bible, it refers to the angels. That, that assembly, he calls them as an assembly. He says, sons of God came before the Lord in the book of Job. You know, and these were all angels. So, it says, and we use that, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the sons of God. So, there were 70 areas for the 70 nations. And it sounds like he put, 70 angels over the 70 nations but in verse 9 but for the Lord's portion as his people is foreshadowing of his chosen ones Jacob is his inheritance but what he's saying is the, na the 70 nations are under the control of the 70 angels but this one group Abraham's little group and of course Israel is just a portion of, of uh, Abraham's group. But he's looking forward. He's saying there's a group out of this group that's going to belong to me. Don't touch them. You got no say in what they do. I will deal with them. And I choose only that nation to deal with. And so you get all this, uh, these 70 angels over the 70 nations, and then you, I mean, if, if you, you know, look at your Greek, you know, they always talk about Greek history and Greek philosophy and Greek this and Greek that. Well, I mean, come on. Um, if memory serves, the, the city of Athens, its original name was Osiria, named after the god Osiris, because the Greeks went down into Egypt to learn. And so they came back and Osiris, you know, was God. And they named that area, we call it Athens today, they named it Osiria. So, you know, all that's, I say all that to say this, is that uh, the nations 
have multiple their view once they fell away from the understanding of the Most High Yahweh and Ohanu. Their view was that these gods of their areas, these angels of their areas, were actually starting to be worshipped as gods. And so, you know, just look at the, the Greek gods or the Roman gods. You, you got the, you know, Zeus, you know, you got Athena, you know, you got Apollyon, the destroyer. Oh, that's a good one. Is that Apollyon, Apollo, he, he, they talk about him in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. So we can get into that at some point, not right now, but that that tells you something he's making a, that angel who is known as apollo apollo makes a comeback in the last days and he goes into perdition to destroy he is the destroyer so we're going to leave that alone for right now but keep in mind these angels were starting to be worshiped as gods you know some might call him uh, baal some might call another angel molech or Dagon, or, you know, whatever. But these angels started to be worshipped as gods. And so, um, the, in the scriptures, they're even called gods. King James puts the little G on it, so it's G-O-D-S, the little G. When he's talking about the Most High Yahweh, El Reino, uh, he puts a big G, because he's the creator. And I find it odd that people say God which sounds an awful like like God to the L, by the way. Um, but, but they cannot frame their mouth to say Yahweh. Yahweh is the one that created the universe. So why can't you say it? You know, it's kind of, I've heard every argument of why, why you don't have to say it. Why I don't want to say it. But if you think about it, ye know not what spirit you are of. It's, it's, it's a very simple matter. Okay, if his name is Yahweh, why don't you say it? <laughs> it's just the craziest state to me. So that's a, uh, people are just in a crazy state, you know. And so the creator of the universe has a name and it's Yahweh. You know, and some people say Ahaya, and I get that, and I'm not mad at them because, you know, to say Ahaya, Moses asked, on Mount Sinai, he asked the Most High, what is your name? They're going to ask me what your name is. He says, Ahaya, Ahaya, I am, or I, I exist, I will be. But when Moses comes down the mountain and the people ask him what his name is, he says, Yahweh, Yahweh, he is, he is, he will be. <laughs> you know, So it's not really a confusion. It's, it's uh, six of one thing, half dozen of another. But when you speak of him, you should say Yahweh, right? So that's, anyway, we'll, we'll leave that alone. Leave that for another video. And so you have the 70 angels, but then you go to the book of Daniel, chapter 10, verse 10, okay? And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright. For unto thee I, uh, am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard. And I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. Get that. So here's an angel saying that some prince of Persia withstood him. Well, come on, you know, the prince of Persia is obviously not a human man. It's one of those angels which was over that landmass called Persia, right? But his little, it's like he's playing chess. All these angels are playing chess. This one is good. He's, he's winning, you know, so they're playing, playing against each other. So... But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief, what? Princes came to help me and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So the archangel Michael is called a prince. But there's also a prince of the kingdom of Persia. Uh, so Michael is called the 
prince, essentially, he's the prince of Israel, whereas there's a prince of Persia. Because Michael is called the angel that standeth for uh, the people of Israel. So his territories, he's working directly under the Most High. His territory is Israel. We have this prince of Persia, his territory, that angel, his territory is Persia. And he's the top reigning dog at the, uh, on earth at the time, right? So let's continue. So what are we talking about? You know, Paul gets into, and I used to read this not quite, I mean, I would get it, but now I get it better, you know. So Paul writes, uh, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, uh, by the way, this is Romans 8, chapter 38. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, princes, principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That word principalities, hopefully now it means a little more to you when you think of princes, you have princes of the of humans, but you have principalities that govern the princes of the humans, these angelic beings. And of course, what do they call? And I'm going to say his name this way: Gadriel. They call him the prince of the power of the air, or Satan. You know, but we talked about that. Satan is a kingdom; it's not one guy, right? But Gadriel is the one that deceived Eve in the garden. So we're going to call him. When I say Satan, I want you to picture Gadriel, and and I'm I'm not, I'm holding on to that with two fingers because I can't be 100 percent sure on that. It just everything lines up to that one. Uh, Ephesians chapter three verse nine through eleven, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. Who created all things by Jesus Christ. All things were created by Jesus Christ. And what does John call Jesus Christ? In the beginning was God and the Word. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. All things were made through Jesus Christ. But by the power of the Holy Spirit. And once you understand that concept, it all starts to make sense. I, uh, I'm going to get to that at some other time. But it's, it's, he tells you what he is. The Most High tells you what he is. And I, I, I'm not going to go into it right now, but to the intent that now unto the principalities, the angelic beings ruling the earth and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he proposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, principalities, the princes of Persia and the princes of Greece and you know, there are principalities, Gog of Magog, uh, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness, uh, rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You get it? There's, there's an entire organizational structure at work. There's a kingdom at work. It's not one guy. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And then we go to the book of Enoch, as book 2 called the parables chapter 1 verse 31 and I went over this a little bit so I won't belabor the point and I heard the fourth voice fending off the Satans plural 
and forbidding them to come before the Lord of Spirits, the Most High Yahuwah, Elohim, Elohim, to accuse them who dwell on the earth. Again, in the book of Enoch, book three, known as the book of Noah, chapter two, verse seven, a command is going forth from the presence of the Lord concerning those who dwell on the earth, that their ruin is accomplished because they have learnt all the secrets of the angels and all the violence of the Satans, plural, and all their powers, the most secret ones, the worst being the art of war taught to them by Azazel. And so um, we're going to take a look back in Daniel again. And I went over this in the previous visit, uh, videos. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, and remember, he's looking at the statue uh, of Nebuchadnezzar's dream statue, the head of gold, legs and chest of silver, a body of bronze, legs of iron, but the feet are made of iron mixed with clay, and everyone is wondering, what does that mean? And I have se uh, not several, but a few takes on it. But uh, let's go into it a little bit. Uh, Daniel chapter 2, verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron. You notice that God, when he talks about men, he always talks about them as clay. In fact, Adam means red earth or red clay. Um, and so that's... That, hold that in the back of your mind. So part of potter's clay and part of iron. What is the iron? That's the principality governing that area, the Roman Empire. Some people say it's actually Gog. I don't think so, but it could be. Um, but there's an angelic principality that is quite powerful. Uh, in fact, it's probably... Satan himself, or God to the L, I'm guessing, if we want to use that term. The kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken, or brittle, is another word of saying it, not necessarily broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Where have we heard that before? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Who's the they? Man, you don't. You guys have no clue what's coming. There's a, a nephilim. <laughs> there is a nephilim about to be built to rule this earth or the Roman Empire at least, but he will have sway over the entire earth. No, At no point in time has anyone ever had sway over the entire earth. But if you looked at this past uh, pandemic, um, I saw for the first time that people in power could mobilize all human beings on earth and and give mandates to everybody on earth at the same time. And I thought that was, wow, that's a, that's a first. That nobody at no other time in history could that have been, could that have happened. So there's something coming that's going to have power over the entire earth. So, you know, and it doesn't mean necessarily every single person, but you get the picture. This is a global reach, not just a, a reach in air, a small area in Europe or something, but, a global reach. So, anyways, I think I'll end it there. And uh, we'll... Uh, black screen, huh? But uh, we'll uh, continue this in the next video. In the meantime, family, uh, you know, God bless you all. And... Uh, Remember, those who worship the most time must worship him in spirit. So, worship in spirit, pray unceasingly, and uh, keep the faith. God bless you all. Uh, Father Yah.
Father Yahweh, bless you all.